morning. <laughs> Afternoon now, I suppose. Uh, I want to start with a warning, because hackers are everywhere. Uh, <laughs> And uh, this, this track, I think, is called Why Security Still Matters. And I can tell you why security still matters, because of this guy. <laughs> You've seen him before <laughs> in his suit and his balaclava, hacking into everything, right? <laughs> or indeed this... Oh, sorry, you can, you can get a picture of that. <laughs> or indeed this lady who... <laughs> apparently managed to get hold of a laptop while in jail in order to continue to hack into you and your users' accounts. Or this guy who is so bright he needs sunglasses and a darkened room in order to <laughs> break into your websites. But you can tell it's working because there is money pouring out of the keyboard. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is Thorne Ash. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist for uh, a little company called Twilio. Uh, we're based out of San Francisco, and we like to make it easy for, for you and your applications to communicate. Uh, and that can be via phone calls, text messaging, video, other kind of messaging, all sorts of stuff. And if you want to know any more about that, please do ask me later. Uh, but uh, today we are, we are talking about um, security, and I thought I wittily titled this, uh, this presentation 2FAWTF. Um, all I'm really talking about is, is two-factor authentication. Um, who here has heard of two-factor authentication before? That is mostly, that's good. Um, keep, keep your hands, uh, like, hold on. put your hands back up if you have, and then, like, put your hands down if you, no, wait. Keep your hands up if, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> keep your hands up if you use two-factor authentication in all your accounts, if you have your, like, your email locked down with that, if you put your hat, all, all of, as many as you can. <laughs> um, like, I mean, because if, if you're not doing that, then, um, uh, you can go find somewhere with some real internet and uh, <laughs> you know go set that up because that's kind of important and I'm going to go uh, through uh, why in a bit. Uh, has anybody implemented two-factor authentication in, a, in an application tool yourselves? Uh, one person. Okay, cool. I guess that's you know, mainly why you're here to know about how to do that kind of thing. Um, just as a quick definition to get started, two-factor authentication is a security process in which a user provides two different forms of identification in order to authenticate themselves with a system. Uh, they must come from different categories. Uh, two passwords is not going to help. Um, but So it's normally something you know uh, and something you have, uh, normally a phone, a device, something like that these days. Um, the th there's a third option, uh, which is kind of something you are, like a kind of biometric thing. Um, a little bit uh, harder, obviously, to, to deal with. Uh, and I have heard of like fingerprints being uh, 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 called, um, like they are 10 passwords that you can't revoke. Um, so like <laughs> it, it, something, you, something you know, something you have is, our, is kind of our safest kind of bet of, uh, of, of two, two factors right now. Um, we do, in fact, all use uh, two-factor authentication in our daily lives. Uh, if you have a, a, a debit card, a credit card, something from your bank, the idea of having the card and knowing the PIN is, uh, is two-factor authentication that we've all dealt with. Um, kind of nice. So um, why are we talking about this? Why, why does security still matter? Why is this guy getting away with uh, everything he's doing? Um, I just want to give a couple of examples of, of reasons that like, just single-factor authentication just does not, um, does not really work for us anymore in, in the world. Like, passwords are broken, that kind of thing. Uh, and I want to introduce you to uh, this guy. This is Matt Honan. He is a, uh, a journalist. Uh, and in 2012, so this is actually quite an old story, and I heard a, a, a recently updated kind of different version um, just yesterday, so I didn't have time to put it in the slides. But, um, uh, in 2012, he was hacked into and his online life was effectively destroyed, uh, which was rather sad. Uh, but he found out what happened. And uh, so what we can do is kind of break down exactly what happened and, and kind of over time how it, how it occurred. So the, uh, the attackers uh, uh, decided they wanted to, to attack uh, Matt. And they found his, uh, his Gmail address on his personal site, perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, and they entered that in Gmail and found out that he had a backup code uh, at, at me.com, uh, Apple's uh, obviously terrible uh, email. Uh, and, they, uh, and so what they did was they called up Amazon uh, to add a credit card to Matt's file. It's kind of nice of them, sounds good. Uh, and so um, in order to do this, they needed to get past security on Amazon kind of support. 
and uh, they did so, uh, like they couldn't answer any of the, they didn't have a password, they didn't have any security questions. Uh, and eventually uh, Amazon boiled down to asking like, okay, what's, what's your name, your email address, and your uh, a billing address? Uh, and so they'd found the billing address uh, by doing a who is lookup on, on his personal site. Like it's, unless you have uh, privacy on who is, you probably also have your addresses all over the place. I do, it's terrifying. Um, and and that's, like, that's, that's about the most technical thing they did in this hack, by the way, uh, is, is to look up who is. So once they gave those details to Amazon, they were able to add a credit card to the file. Um, it didn't matter what credit card, because uh, the next thing they did was put the phone down, paint it up again, and said, hey, Amazon, I'd like to reset my password. Uh, and they went through all the security questions, which they couldn't answer, eventually boiled down to that. Then they required uh, an email address, billing address, and uh, the last four digits of a credit card that they had on file. <laughs> so they gave the last four digits of that credit card that they had, uh, and, um, uh, and boom, they've reset the, uh, the reset the password, they've changed the email address to which the password sent, and they've got access to the Amazon account. Uh, now inside that Amazon account, they then had all the other credit cards uh, that had been added to that real billing addresses. Now obviously you can't see all 16 digits, they're not stealing credit card details at this point, but you could see the last four. So they called up Apple to reset the password and they went through the same process and eventually boiled down to name, billing address and the last four digits of a credit card on file, which they had from the Amazon account. Uh, and this is where kind of times start coming in as well as, as this is reconstructed. Uh, and at 450, uh, that, meant it, that meant they could reset the Apple ID password to a, an email of theirs, and they gained access to the me.com account. And then things started to really happen fast as um, two minutes later, they reset the Gmail account password to the me.com password. Uh, nine minutes later, they remotely wiped his iPhone from his Apple account because, yeah. Um, <laughs> and this is the point he started to get suspicious that something was going on as he ended up with a brick in his hand. Uh, they then reset his Twitter password back to his Gmail. That was, uh, that was fun as well. Uh, five, 5.05, they wiped his MacBook entirely clean and deleted his Google account. <laughs> uh, and then uh, 12 minutes past five, they posted on Twitter to say this is what they'd done uh, from his account, of course. Um, <laughs> Uh, which was weird, actually, because uh, before that, they were posting uh, racist and homophobic slurs um, on his Twitter account, and then they were like, that was us. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> um, the reason for this hack, the entire reason that uh, this group of hackers decided it was a good idea to, to break this guy's life, and like he lost a few, uh, I, I think he eventually recovered, but at the time, he hadn't done particularly good backups on his phone or his MacBook, so when they were wiped, he lost a bunch of photos uh, of, of like his his daughter and, and the family, and so that was kind of really very sad. And the entire reason for this was because he had a three-letter Twitter name, uh, because he managed to sign up fairly early on, and the hackers literally just wanted to, uh, to, to get hold of that and to post ridiculous things on Twitter. It's kind of lucky, I guess, in a way, like they could have used the Amazon account to spend all his money, that kind of thing, but um, it just seems like with, with one tiny technical bit of knowledge that uh, like being able to look up an address on who is, um, they were able to destroy this, this guy's life. And if you think about it, like if, uh, if the Amazon account, if the Apple account, if the Google accounts, the Twitter account, all of that, if any of them had two-factor authentication on them, there's no way you can, uh, there's maybe ways, but like ideally there'd be no way to socially engineer your way into that. Uh, and that's, that's kind of sad. Um, more why, you might be thinking more why, like, um, that you're also probably a smart developer. Maybe you're using like a, a password uh, thing, like uh, like a one password or last pass, that kind of thing. And you've got very secure passwords. They're different everywhere, uh, and they're obviously not in danger of being guessed at any point. Um, but I want to talk about a different hack. Um, last year, uh, you you might have heard the the Ashley Madison uh, website was destroyed, um, uh, and for whatever reason. Um, but uh, with, the with the dump of data that, that um, arrived online, uh, a security company was able to uh, actually break the, uh, the password hashing and reveal 11 million of the passwords. Uh, so on this uh, super, like, you probably want to keep your account on this private uh, website. What do you think the number one password of those 11 million uh, uh, accounts was? Any guesses about passwords? One, two, three, four, five, six, exactly. <laughs> uh, what I really like is that in at number two, uh, there are some incredibly lazy people <laughs> who couldn't make it all the way to six. 
Um, password uh, is, of course, in at number three, uh, an absolute classic. I don't understand capital's default, but that, that, was, that was number four. Um, less lazy people got all the way up to nine. <laughs> uh, and there's a few more. We've got QWERTY, that's good. There's an eight. Uh, ABC123, classic as well. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the password wasn't NSFW, but I didn't want to put what it was on screen. You can go look that up later if you want to. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, you can imagine what it might be. Uh, and then in at number 10 was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, and the scary thing about this is it's not like a, a couple of people or like 10 people use 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but 120,000 people use the password 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, so um, users are pretty bad with passwords, even if uh, there are smart users who are not bad with passwords. Um, we have, I think, as, as application developers and as people who have uh, applications out there that keep hold of user data and, and are important to users, um, that they're not going to look after it, so we have to make them. And that's, uh, I think, kind of my argument for, for two-factor authentication and why, why we should use it. Uh, cool. So uh, how, how do we use it? What is, how does it work? Um, you probably know a reasonable user registration flow involves you giving an email and password and then clicking sign up. That's perfectly reasonable. And then when you sign back in, you put that email and password in. And that's how it works. Um, when we're using two-factor authentication, we then have a, a couple of uh, different routes that we could go down. Uh, the first one being SMS. And I like to talk about that because I work for Twilio, and that's uh, an awful lot of what we do. Um, I'm not going to bash you over the head with that at all. But like uh, the idea with, with uh, an SMS-based two-factor authentication is um, you visit that registration page, you have to take the user's phone number as well, of course, uh, and uh, they're logged in. You could do a verification step at this point, make sure they've given you the right number, otherwise they don't get to log in ever to their account. Um, but when they log in, enter the password, uh, enter the username, if that's fine, then we can use uh, 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 some sort of service uh, to generate, we generate some kind of code. Um, they tend to be six digits. That seems to be a popular number of digits for this kind of thing. Uh, in this particular case, you, they just can be a random six digits. Uh, we'll get on to other generations of code uh, later. Uh, you enter that, and everyone's happy. Like, we check that was the code. There are some pros and cons to using SMS for this kind of thing. Um, SMS is not inherently a safe transport layer. Uh, it can be intercepted, uh, which is it's, it's not the easiest of things to do, but uh, it's possible. Um, but most people do have a device uh, that can receive an SMS message. Like, if you are trying to get security out to your users, it is relatively guaranteed that they can all receive SMS somehow. Um, on the uh, kind of con side of thing again, um, they can't receive them if they're underground, for example. Uh, always, a, uh, always an issue if you try to log in and you have no service or you're abroad, all sorts of things like that, and you don't have any, any kind of SMS service. Uh, and uh, similarly, it, it's probably going to cost in order to send those messages. That's a, that's a, a cost. Certainly, if you use Twilio, it will charge you per message. Um, and uh, that's how we make money. I think that's reasonable. <laughs> um, it's also theoretically slow. Right? It uh, can be slow. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and like, again, like we work on making coverage as best as possible, but even then, like, most of the services, it's possible to have black spots. It's possible to have regional kind of uh, issues. Um, I think in India, uh, uh, we can only send messages between like uh, business hours, uh, which, which is just like that. That is entirely on the country restricting the services, and it's probably not. It's probably different there. It's probably the same for other services that work there too. So, um, yeah, there's, there's there's various problems with that. So, uh, what are our alternatives? Um, the, the software token, uh, which is also kind of useful. We have, um, we now mostly, uh, particularly uh, kind of Western world, we have um, smartphones an awful lot, right? I mean, there's probably a lot of, there are a lot of feature phones in the world, but there are an increasing number of smartphones in the world. So what we can do with that is um, when a user signs up, we generate them uh, some sort of secret. Uh, we need to get that secret to the user. Uh, keep it ourselves, and that is going to be the way we uh, generate codes between the two. And so when you log in then, um, uh, and you verify username and password's fine, you have a, a, an application um, on, your, on your phone 
uh, which has that secret embedded in it and is able to generate that secret uh, token. And then you can verify that that's the same. Uh, so these secrets uh, and uh, the method of generating uh, a token from them uh, are under these uh, two kind of standards, um, uh, HOTP and TOTP. That's uh, the HMAC-based one-time password and then time-based one-time password. Uh, it's been around since uh, the 80s. Um, uh, and it used to be like in the, this used to be done in physical tokens, which is obviously uh, uh, quite an expense, but this is why we do it in apps now. It's much cheaper uh, because people can have those phones. And, um, and this is the kind of mathematical uh, look at how, um, how a, a, an HMAC-based one-time password is, is generated. And all you need is that, uh, is the secret uh, and a counter. Uh, and then you run some stuff against it. So you make an HMAC digest of the counter and the secret. You, you truncate that, uh, and this is, um, this is a part of the algorithm I haven't quite got around, but it's a, it's a method of like picking, uh, I think it's uh, four, byte, four or 16 bytes out the middle uh, of, the, uh, of the long digest, uh, and it, 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 it's generated again based kind of on that secret. Um, that's just a bit marks to make it sure it's a positive number at the end. Uh, and then um, you just kind of take the uh, uh, mod 10 to the power of number of digits you want, so normally six. And there you go, you've got your, your HOTV value. And the server can work that out, and the app can work that out, and everyone agrees. Uh, and actually, um, I realize it's, it's a fairly heavily kind of Java kind of conference, but um, this is a, a node library, which I'm about to kind of go and show a couple of bits with. Uh, but it's really quite good as uh, like, if you want to see how the algorithm for this works, it's very readable to, to go through uh, uh, just this, this library. It's, it's very nice. Uh, and then so time-based one-time passwords is exactly the same. It's just the counter is um, based on time. Uh, you can choose your period. Uh, most people go for 30 seconds. Uh, and so you just take the time since epoch, uh, um, divide by your period, and that is your counter. And that's something, hopefully, uh, as long as your clocks are uh, aligned, uh, both the server and the application can agree on as well. Uh, so I do, do want to just quickly uh, demo uh, creating those tokens. Can you read that at the back, by the way? Yeah, cool. All right. Um, uh, I'm just going to open up in Node and uh, get myself that NOTP library. Uh, and I'm just going to take a quick look at how this works. So we've got uh, HOTP. I don't know why I need vars in this. It's a terrible idea. Um, so with HOTP, we've got two functions, generate and verify. Uh, and when you generate, you just generate with a token uh, and the uh, counter uh, for that time. Uh, nope. Gen, not get. Now, that is a function. <laughs> Oh, I've done, okay. apologies. There we go, now it's a function. Uh, and then we get a six-digit counter, um, a six-digit uh, thing. And so if you change the counter, it changes, and there's no way you can work out uh, without that secret the difference between that first one, the second one, the third one at all. And when you go to verify, um, actually it's much easier to do just by adding here. We're going to go verify that, and we'll verify uh, that first one, which is 825147. Uh, and that gives us back, I, I, and I think this library is pretty good because that gives you back a delta, so a difference between uh, the counters on that. Uh, and so you can give kind of a sliding window of uh, checking on the, uh, on the actual verification of the code, um, which is kind of useful, particularly actually when you get to um, the time-based uh, ones, uh, because uh, you've probably got to that point if you've used your, uh, your two-factor authentication app and it's counting down, you're like, I need to type it in really quickly. <laughs> hopefully, um, <laughs> uh, hopefully you don't because I did get again. Oh, what's up with me? Uh, hopefully you don't um, because uh, it will have done some sort of uh, similar kind of uh, verification Oops, as, as this in which... Three four three zero two two. Uh, that's a delta of zero, so that's still within the time period of just now. But uh, now it's ticked over to the next one. But if you can give a window of say three or uh, four deltas or something like that, 
I say either side, but you're probably not going to get a code from the future. Um, <laughs> I mean, that would completely break this, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, you could if the, if the clock is ahead. That is true, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, so right, you can have a delta e each side, and, and that way uh, um, you don't have to rush your users through that. All you have to do is remember that code that you're seeing. Um, so I think there's a great little library for this. Uh, there is a, 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 no, a, a Ruby library that I was looking at as well, which does not do this. You have to manually do the, uh, the, the verifying and the deltas yourself, uh, which is um, rather a shame. It doesn't make it as easy. Uh, so um, this is a great library. If you want to see more of how the algorithm works, um, go check out... Uh, go check it out on GitHub. Um, and if you want to play with it, or if you want to make some sort of two-factor authentication service yourself, then I, uh, I think it's very good. Um, so in terms of sharing these secrets, though, this is kind of uh, the interesting thing uh, I think about all of this. Like the, the algorithm's been here for 20 years, and it's very secure. Everybody's happy with that. Um, but the, the, the common way to share these secrets uh, is, is probably the, the QR code. Uh, that's probably what, if you've ever used the Google Authenticator app, like you, you log in, you, you set up your thing, and, and you like QR code off the screen. And this is how that works. Uh, it, it's a URL um, with the OTP or uh, protocol, and then you put in the type, label, and some parameters. Uh, and so that's a little bit small, but if I can just go through that, uh, this is just an example one that uses TOTP. Uh, the label's example, so that's kind of, that would be your company name or the application name you're talking about. Uh, and that is an identifier for the user, really, to say this is this, is this account on this uh, application. Uh, and then you share the secret in there, uh, as well as the issuer, which again is the application. It's recommended you use both the label and the issuer, that uh, the label can be more specific to the user and their account at the time. Uh, so you create that URL, tie, uh, tie it up into a QR code, and then uh, this is my favorite Tumblr of all time. Uh, still no posts. Uh, <laughs> QR codes, eh? They're fun times. Um, <laughs> um, but like, I mean, maybe maybe QR codes are the uh, the the. Oh, sorry, maybe um, two-factor authentication and this uh, the sharing of secrets is the one good reason to have QR codes in the world. Um, although I do get to come onto pros and cons, and uh, flashing a QR code up on screen uh, means that if somebody is trying to uh, get your account or anything, it's it's on screen. And if you do it in public, for example, that's a bad idea. Uh, it is it is kind of an out in the open thing. Um, so that kind of one thing against it. Again, it, it's still definitely harder to hack this than just a password. So always, it's a good thing, but there are potential issues. Uh, on, in terms of pros, okay. Um, uh, you uh, obviously can do this offline uh, in, a, in a bunker under the water. It doesn't matter. Like your application has has control of that secret right there, and you can generate this code and agree with the other side of things. Um, and again, like the prevalence uh, of uh, uh, smartphones uh, amongst users uh, is is very handy for this kind of thing. Uh, on the uh, on the bad side again. Um, no, nope, maybe there aren't any other bad things. I thought I had one then. No, nope. we'll move on. Uh, can it be better? Um, uh, I'd like to think so. Um, I, actually, I, I really, I do have this issue with this kind of the, the sharing of the secret, uh, especially because um, actually, what you'll find with with uh, Google, for example, I know they like you share the secret, you've got it in the app, and then they're like, okay, and here are the actual codes to get around it. Like they provide you the way around the two-factor authentication system, and they're like, print these out and put them in a drawer. And maybe that's cool, but like, you still have that password. There's, there is an e there exists a password in which you can get around two-factor authentication, and that's a uh, that's a bit of a shame uh, because you know you have that code, and it's. Um, the app has the secret, but if you if you lose your phone, if you destroy the if you if you lose your phone, if you change your phone or something like that, you have to regenerate the codes, uh, but you have to be able to log in in order to do that. So uh, that's why they have these backup codes, and that's all kind of good and bad. So can it be better? Uh, I always um, like the idea like that, that, that friends don't let friends build their own uh, authentication frameworks. Uh, you know, there are people who are very smart and build their own like. There are open source, uh, like I work a lot with Rails, uh, and there is uh, Devise is a library that you know has been around for an awful long time and does authentication and does it as securely as possible and has the best kind of uh, best practices. Um, 
and you know, dumb, like looked over by other security professionals. Uh, like I am not a security professional, so I do not know how to make something absolutely 100% secure. Um, so I, I kind of think that's the same for, for two-factor authentication. Uh, and when, uh, you know, there's all very well that the user has to look after their side of the secret, but the, the you know, if you've built this application yourself, you have to look after that secret uh, and keep that safe from everyone. Otherwise, like, if you let all the secrets out, then um, everybody's compromised. So uh, I want to just quickly kind of introduce you to, uh, there's a company called Authy. They're actually part of Twilio. We bought them just a, almost a year ago, uh, and they do uh, two-factor authentication as, as kind of a service, as an API. Uh, and it's effectively three API calls, and you've got two-factor authentication kind of sorted. And then they can worry about like keeping everything 100% uh, secure. Uh, and so in this case, when you, when you register a user, um, you take their phone number, and the phone number is effectively the thing that they have, uh, although you can kind of spread Authy amongst devices. Uh, and you register the user with their phone number uh, to Authy and get back an ID. And all you have to do is look after that ID. Um, and then log them in. And then when they come and uh, log in again, uh, you just need to, you make uh, API call number two, which uh, prompts the user for, uh, for a code. Uh, and if the user has signed up using SMS, then they will get the SMS code. If they have the application, uh, Authy has an application that's kind of like a competitor to Google Authenticator, although I think it's a lot better. Um, uh, Authy will prompt them to to get open the application and uh, and get the code out of there. In fact, they um, send a push notification to kind of buzz the application and be like, "Okay, use me now," uh, which is kind of cool. And then you can either way, like SMS or or app, um, enter that. And the third API call is just um, checking, verifying that code with Authy to make sure that was correct as well. And they control all the kind of sliding windows and that kind of thing of of time based stuff. Uh, and then there's the future, not this guy, he's not the future. Um, I mentioned like the application does push notifications uh, to kind of wake you up and say this app wants, can, wants uh, you to look at its code. But I also, um, uh, what's quite nice with, with Authy because they control the application and the, and the server side is that they never have to show you a QR code. Um, the, you have a, a secure and encrypted connection between, uh, well, the Authy app and the Authy service has a secure encrypted connection between it, uh, and um, the secrets are actually pushed uh, down to your phone. You never have to share it out loud out on a screen or anything like that. Um, it also means that if, some, if that secret gets compromised, Authy can actually rotate the secret and you never have to do anything either. Uh, but um, just pushing to say, fill in the six digit code, seven digit code is a little bit uh, annoying. And I don't know about you, uh, I don't know about you all, but like typing those codes in is annoying. <laughs> like this is probably one of the main reasons against having two-factor authentication is because it's going to put users off or make them less likely to want to log into your service. Um, I just want to show you this quick video of a demo uh, that um, uh, this is this is based on Authy, but I, you can build this yourself, of course. Um, but the idea is that uh, the application, and that's my phone on the other side of the screen there. Uh, not only does it like send a push notification to say, "Hey, this person wants to." Uh, you know, it, somebody's trying to log into your account, uh, you can actually um, then uh, accept that request to log in uh, via the application. It shows you a bunch of details about the things you're doing. And when you do that, uh, uh, you can then, you'll get a, the application gets a callback from Authy to say, yep, this is cool. And then you can move the person on. Um, and I, th I just think that's such uh, a better kind of user experience for this kind of thing. Uh, it saves all the yeah the six digit seven digit numbers. It saves uh, SMS. It saves uh, all of that kind of thing. And it's just and I think like the magical part, particularly if you're doing two factor authentication for something like a transaction. And this example application is a bank. Uh, you can you can start sending in the details down there, things like the the transaction amount and that kind of thing. So you can absolutely be sure that you are uh, authenticating uh, the exact thing you're trying to do. Um, so I think that's kind of cool. That's uh, what I'd like to call the future. Um, there are some pros and cons to it, of course. Again, it still requires somebody to have a, a smartphone application uh, and a smartphone themselves. But um, what I really like is the, uh, like, it's the kind of web idea of progressive enhancement. It's like most people can receive an SMS. Uh, a bunch of people have smartphones and uh, can then, uh, like, they can generate a code. And then if they accept, like, the next level, they can, 
uh, accept things within the application. And so there's kind of like a, a graceful degradation of, uh, of, of ways to get hold of the, the um, ways to produce a secret and to make that second factor authenticate. So in summary, uh, users are bad with passwords. Uh, other websites can be bad with passwords as well. Uh, I'm sure that Ashley Madison hack was pretty, uh, and the, the subsequent password list uh, was kind of useful for other people who wanted to use those and try them against other websites. Um, and two-factor authentication can be that push, uh, token, or SMS, and uh, using all three uh, together uh, to give the best experience to your users uh, is, a, is the right way to, um, to make authentication work. Uh, and finally, uh, two-factor authentication is for your users, particularly those users that like one, two, three, four, five, six as a password. <laughs> um, uh, so don't let this guy <laughs> get away with uh, what I think is, uh, I think he stole that from the URL bar. Uh, <laughs> that, that's some serious hacking. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's all, I've got, uh, all I've got for you today. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's not all. I have one tiny plug. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday when I gave a talk as well, that uh, Twilio are holding a conference in San Francisco in May. It's called Signal, and it is about all kinds of uh, communication. And, uh, and also, we have a, a fairly strong uh, emphasis on, on security as well, as, uh, as Orthia is a very important part of it. So um, uh, I'd really like you to come along to the conference, please. I know it's San Francisco, but it's going to be great. It's two days of awesome stuff. Uh, if you use um, the uh, promo code PNASH20, that's uh, my name, PNASH20, you get 20% off tickets. Uh, and that really is all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions at all. Uh, yeah, we have time for some questions. Okay, does so anybody have a question? Yeah. <laughs> do you? Yes. Oh, the microphone for it as well. So how do, you, how do you cope with logins on the mobile device? If you have the mobile device and you're... And, and you have the Twilio, uh, the, the, the app also on the mobile device, so, so kind of the, important the, the, the second thing, factor is not there, is it? The important thing about the second factor is that it's, it's out of band. It's not the same uh, mechanism uh, that the application is talking, uh, that you're talking to the application at. And so if you're in a, a mo mobile application or something like that, then um, uh, and you're, you're probably talking to a remote service over HTTP, but like getting a push notification, getting an SMS is out of band from that. And so it, it still counts as that second factor. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but if, if someone steals my phone. <laughs> if someone steals your phone. Um, <laughs> uh, no, what's, what's quite nice actually is, you, um, I mean, one, one thing I didn't mention is that if you, if you build your own two-factor authentication thing and somebody steals your phone, like you also have to build a, a help service, a, a support service for users who are into that thing, kind of thing. So Authy provides that. Somebody, if, so in the case of Authy, if somebody, if you lose your phone, if it's stolen, um, you can get in touch with them, prove that you're you, and then they will revoke all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so Authy requires like uh, official identification, like you send in a passport, that kind of thing. And, and, uh, and I'm not entirely sure of their entire support process. I haven't had to lose my phone. So, <laughs> um, but I mean, as we discussed the kind of um, social engineering aspect of, uh, of, of breaking people's accounts, um, I think, I mean, they work as hard as possible to make it the absolute safest. Uh, apparently, Amazon hasn't quite learned from that experience yet, as there was a Medium post like uh, two weeks ago with another guy who was like, somebody keeps looking up my uh, address. And he kept getting like transcripts of chat support sent to his email where somebody else was saying, hey, I just need to know where that thing I was getting is being sent. <laughs> Uh, so they're still kind of giving that stuff away, but uh, I know that I know that the Authy team is doing as much as it can to be as secure as possible. Uh, and again, like it's kind of like they're probably more secure than everybody doing it on their own. <laughs> uh, we had uh, kind of that case. A colleague of mine was using two-factor authentication on his iPhone with the uh, not the Authy app, but uh, Google Authenticator, something, like that. something in between another application, and uh, he lost his phone or it got stolen or something that. The only thing you had to do was to wipe the phone remotely and mm. then you get your new iPhone and uh, restore from iCloud and there is your two-factor authentication back there. Right, and, and so you could do, the, I mean, you can do the same with Authy. If, like, if the phone goes missing, you wipe the, wipe the device, that takes it off of there. That's a, that's a good point. And what's nice with that one is actually you can, uh, if you get another phone, you, you can't necessarily restore everything or if you haven't backed up correctly. Um, 
Uh, if you log into Authy, it will, in fact, then set up that secure channel, send all your secrets down again, possibly refresh the secrets even if it's a new thing. In fact, yeah, you can use Authy on multiple devices and you get different secrets per device. So, um, like, if one goes and somebody gets the secrets out of there, you can revoke that device from another one and you still have access via that as well. Anybody else at all? Go for it. Um, that's not something, um, I, I mean, like, I, I think they have, uh, enough problems in themselves as it, like, it's expensive. Uh, if you need to revoke it, that requires a whole lot more hardware things being sent out to all your users. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, they're, they're possibly more secure because people are more likely to, uh, look after them, uh, better than maybe their phone. They probably don't take them out drinking, for example. Uh, although I did, I don't know if you saw the, um, uh, there was an article recently about uh, like a, a site that kind of has a search engine for people's open webcams, that kind of thing. And it was beautifully pointed out that one person, uh, at least one person has been found like with one of those security tokens and a webcam, which is then like without username and password on it, just pointing at it. <laughs> so like, yeah, I don't need to take my token with me. It's like I can always access it online. <laughs> um, but I don't know, uh, like, Authy doesn't do um, physical tokens right now. Um, and I, like, in terms of development, in terms of normal application development, it would be like that's another step uh, in order to, to create them. Like, not that it's impossible, but uh, in order to secure as many users as we can, I think it's uh, like software based stuff or uh, is, is probably for the best. Anybody else at all? All right, well, you've been absolutely lovely. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>